Welcome everybody to the Talent Edge uh, seminar on digital innovation in finance. Let's get our panellists to introduce themselves. Where should we start? David. Thank you. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for coming out everybody. Uh, I'm David Lee. I'm CFO. I'd say I'm uh, an experienced CFO, um, have a career and passion for building high growth technology businesses. Um, I'd say I'm industry agnostic, so I've done everything from private aviation to marketplaces to SaaS, e-commerce, gaming, um, from startups to group, uh, group PLCs. So quite a, a journalist, I'd say. Um, that's me. Fantastic. And I think it's worth saying you've done a combination of, you know, very small, almost from first finance hire, Series A, right the way through to your recent venue, which is a 16-year-old company, 600 people, lots of M&A, so lots of kind of mess amongst it, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I think in, in that broad spectrum, I've seen, I think I've seen and, and done ev everything, I Good. think. I'm not going to say everything because I'm not going to get surprised. But um, yeah, I've seen the, the growth stage, you know, building from foundations of zero up to actually, actually there's a transformation needed here. And how do you do that? And, and where does digital and technology play its part? Um, and of course, all the usual CFO good things around you know, building finance teams or fixing finance teams, um, M&A, transactions, financing, exits. Um, and yeah, trying to, to you know, pro profitably grow businesses, really. That's, That's the, the aim of it. Lovely, thank you. Peroska, I'm not even going to try the surname. Kishchitari. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, it is originally Hungarian. Uh, so I have 20 plus years of experience, all of it in finance, different areas of finance. I started off in audit at PwC and then I've done a lot of outsourcing uh, with Jampact uh, and different other outsourcing companies. And uh, recently I have started working as a consultant with large finance transformation programs. And even more recently I started focusing on FP&A transitions and, uh, and all, the, all the fun that comes with that. So big scale FP&A across yeah. media, consumer, lots In of... In real estate, yes. And the most, most recently is an FMCG company. Fantastic. James. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I started my career as an accountant and uh, then drifted and transitioned into uh, technology um, and change and transformation roles. I've spent... Uh, um, best part of 20 odd years in the financial services um, across different um, different sectors, um, doing finance transformation and organisational transformation as well. Um, so it's given me uh, a rounded insight of, I suppose, the, the role that uh, when you're looking just uh, intrinsically on what a finance department does, but also where it fits in in the organisation. And James also has got some experience of remediation when things go wrong, which, which is good because Suzanne Shine, I don't know if you saw, unfortunately, COVID is the gift that keeps on giving and uh, Suzanne has COVID, so she can't join us today. I have got some of her points because she's spoken to me previously, so I'll be bringing up some of the points that she potentially would have made, but I definitely won't be taking Q&A on any of the areas of, <laughs> of that. <coughs> Fantastic. Okay, so let's kick off. Who's going to start? Digital information transform finance. Bruska, tell us, what do you think it looks like 10 years time from now? How is, how is it going to be different? Uh, well, you need a crystal ball for that. Because uh, fire, digital space is changing so fast that predicting what it's going to be 10 years from now is almost impossible. So thinking of what we have now, it is already so much is possible that wasn't possible even five years ago. And uh, that brought finance in the forefront of the change and the transformation that is happening today. Uh, we, we kind of got promoted from being back office and an afterthought. So uh, it gave finance that boost that we are able to do, uh, able to standardize, able to simplify and, and build a very strong platform for growth. Uh, and especially in my area in FPNA, it is so important to get better insights faster uh, that can give, give the edge, the, the competitive advantage of a company. Okay. So where we are going to be in 10 years from now, um, digitization, uh, automation, uh, obviously is, is, uh, is the trend that I think barely started, in all honesty. Uh, so it is, it, it is going to be a lot more uh, prominent. 
uh, with, with uh, integrated ERP systems, but also um, uh, AI is coming up very quickly. Um, a blockchain uh, also is coming up. I haven't really had much to do with that, but I can also see that uh, becoming a very important, maybe you did already, uh, but it, it is, I also see that becoming a, a very important factor in, in, uh, in finance, uh, systems in finance. So I think that we will see a lot more. Uh, transformations are ongoing. They will continue to be ongoing, I think so, because um, it is a new era, a new way of doing things. And I think we all need to keep up. So big changes, but also just incremental, little by little innovations in, you know, with technology. David, are we going to be replaced by robots? Or you, not me, because I'm a recruiter. I think, <laughs> I think um, predicting the future is an interesting thing. I'll come on to the robot thing in a second. Um, I think anyone that's had to build a, a forecast in the last couple of years knows that predicting the next three months is tricky, yeah. let alone five, ten years. Um, but, um, but that said, there's, you know, there's a load of innovation around us over the last five years and now. There's, there's technology that exists, whether it's predictive or, or chat GPT or automation or character recognition. There's loads of tech there. But having the applications and impl implementing it into the, into the teams and making it work and getting the benefits from that is, can be a challenge. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's actually implementing the tech um, I think I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, as qualified accountants or just humans or train, trained professionals, I, you know, I, I don't want my team um, manually entering data or, you know, carry out repetitive tasks that robots can do and should be doing and can do. And do that, it better. That, and do better and more accurately. Um, those, those automations exist today. Um, and actually there's a load of opportunities where you can just automate repetitive tasks. I'd much rather those humans be you know, managing the systems, managing the robots, uh, in, you know, um, reviewing the outputs, uh, the anomalies, giving them the rules, setting the logic, and ultimately helping, you know, using their time on the things that they can't do, which is helping the business be a success. Um, so you know, solving human problems, not, uh, and then the robots do the, the crunching. Um, but not always easy to implement, easy to say, hard to do. So do you think that the, the type of person that you would have in a finance team it's going to change because you're going from these kind of potentially a lot of transactional and numbers based to much more business data analysis. Is, is, that, is that how it will change as well, if using, think, using technology? If I think, um, I don't know if the people will change, I think the, the skills in the people should change, absolutely. Um, there'd be more digital um, capabilities and skills needed and the mindset where actually my job isn't just to transfer data from this system to that system and make sure it's reconciled. It's like, you know, that should just be computers. Um, but actually, how, why, is this in, why is this important and how, how can we make this better or what does this mean to the business and what are the challenges around those things? Um, so I think it's using a high level skill set, but the same, not different people, but I would think potentially skills. you've got to change, isn't it? If you're liaising more with the business rather than sitting behind the scenes, you need a set of influence skills, you need stronger communication skills yeah. potentially. What do you think, James? Yeah. For me, and I think you know, we're absolutely starting to, to see it already and it will continue, it's that speed and insight that people are looking for. You know, finance traditionally was a very look backwards, historical. We've seen that it's, it's now sort of becoming more real time. And I think everyone's data hungry. You know, the, the management around you is data hungry. So people want that information quicker and quicker. So 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was talking about faster financial close. But now we've got to kind of think wider than not just closing, uh, you know, the accounts. It's how do we bring value to the business and almost flip being the traditional cost centre to, a, to being, uh, you know, seen as a, almost a profit centre. Without these teams in place, we can't, you know, uh, navigate and provide the level of stewardship in the business to succeed. So I think there'll be a lot more, I think the tool set's growing, um, Excel is still a very prominent uh, you know, skill out there amongst the accountants, but I think the widening um, and diversification of automation, um, whether that be through um, you know, a, a one system or integrated systems, is going to mean that actually an accountant now or somebody in finance will have a plethora of, of skills 
to bring to the table that would perhaps rival a, a data scientist almost because they've got to, they're probably dealing with more data than they've dealt with previously, historically. So they need to find ways to uh, get the best out of that data. And if I could just expand on that, if you, exactly what you're saying now, combined with FP&A, with, with what I was just talking about, predicting three months of forecast, you know, because finance's job is forecasting and having a plan or you know, whether you hit it or not, is, but actually having the best prediction you can possibly get. You combine data science with you know, good FP&A practices. There, is, there are predictive analytics that exist today. There are tools that you can implement. But depending on what data sources it's using, you know, to, to, if you think about how could you apply a chat GPT data you know, forecasting prediction model that actually takes data points from beyond just you know, what's in the data center. Maybe there's economic data points or customer data points or market, mo market monitoring. Mm -hmm. And to actually feed that into, and this is what your sales cycle is going to look like in the next six, 12 months, I'd, I'd buy that. So accurate forecasts. Yeah, but, but using the, the, the next advanced science, yeah. data science to, to inform yeah. that, that would be, um, I'd, I'd pay for that. Deloitte say in their study that there's not going to be month ends and quarterly or monthly forecasting. It will be the point where that bit is instantaneous and you get yeah, that and it's yeah. all about the interpretation, exactly what we're saying, using it. Yeah, I like that. What about the, um, at the moment there's a few big ERP providers, everything kind of sits with them. There's lots of customization that, that businesses have to do. Do you see that changing? You know, most of our everyday lives we're using apps all the time aren't we and we you know there's been a real shift from big boys to lots of small players who can do a very specific niche thing how, how do you see the kind of old school let's get a system we customize it versus a future of perhaps you know much more players much more flexibility much much different type of information james so i, I think there's a there's a lot more nervousness around what you're actually getting if you bespoke something because you know to to coin the cliche of you know reinventing the wheel that they've got to a size that they've created a tool um, I think it's sometimes uh, incumbent upon you know us as a bit as we implement it to really question why would we want to bespoke it because the costs that that brings you know, upfront costs initially, but then the the cost, the continuing cost to uh, maintain a bespoke system can actually sometimes overrun the, the value of bringing that system in in the first place. So I think um, sometimes there's a, you know, there's a lot more APIs, there's a lot more integrations available. Um, so I, I would always suggest look at yourselves first and go, why do we want to change this? What do we? Th what value are we going to get from this? And then actually look at what else is available. To say, actually, would it be make more sense to make it a sort of closely coupled architecture? So maybe you do invest in an ERP, but then layer things on that, that enable you to move and flex going forward as well. So there's an element of future proofing. Lovely, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail. But I did want to ask you about the death of Excel. <laughs> you, you don't like Excel, do you? I, it's not. I, it, it's a. It's a marmite for me. Excel because you see it get used so much um, that it becomes. It becomes like the primary tool, rather than you know opening the tool kit and going, what shall I you know what shall I pick today you know and and I think the danger is. It also keeps you in, it, it sometimes prevents you being creative and innovative. You'll be creative and innovative within Excel, but there's your, there's your confinement, there's your parameters. Um, so I, I always sort of try to challenge as to why, why Excel? I, I mean, I've seen people manage projects of, and large programs using Excel. Um, I've seen people do something that you go, wouldn't you do that in a PowerPoint presentation? But, you know, because we're in finance, we'll, we'll, we'll knock it up in Excel. Um, so it becomes a crutch and, and I think a, a limiter, really, on what can be achieved. Um, so my suggestion is it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that I do think you should take and accompany, <laughs> and accompany with other things. Everyone checks their own phone. Though, I know. <laughs> Uh, David, would you add anything to that? How are uh, you feeling? Uh, actually, are you still an Excel man? <laughs> um, not myself, actually. 
Um, I used to, um, but I, I completely agree. It's it's a it's a comfort blanket for for finance team, but and it served it served us uh, very well for a long long time. It, it 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 when you've got nothing else actually. If you think about some of the companies I've worked in, where there've been earlier stage companies, actually that there, there is no ERP. So actually, you know, you're um, going just go, maybe connecting those two things around. Um, you know, when you think about the, the, the finance stack, you've got a bit of a choice of, you know, do you just do incremental quick wins, bolt-ons, and build this web of stuff that kind of hangs together, sort of. Um, but, it, you know, as soon as the, comp the, the business gets to a level of complexity, whether it's international complexity or, or product complexity, um, that actually, you, you, it just breaks. Um, you, need, you need that ERP, so that, that upgrade, if you like. Um, but I think, so there's incremental versus big overhaul, and of course that's a big project. Um, but the thing that underpins it all has to be good data discipline, good data architecture, um, because whatever you put on it, you know, that, that's the, almost like the, the foundations of the house. Um, Excel, if you've got nothing else, it works. Um, but there are definitely, but you know, moving finance into being yeah, data savvy, um, and I'm not saying data scientists, but but higher levels on data, then actually, you're right, Excel just becomes one form to, to manipulate that as opposed to the only form. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. So there's a difference I mean, between those small incrementals and small companies in terms of what you do and the bigger companies. I appreciate that. And we'll try and cover both this in this. But the planning stage, before you even start any of these these projects, what are those kind of foundations for successful change? What do you, before you even think we're gonna, we want to do this, where do you start? What's, what, what's, what's the foundation, James? For me, I think you've got to be crystal clear on what you're trying to achieve. What, what is the vision um, and the objectives? Because if you don't get those clarified up front, I'm sure we'll touch on it later, then I find myself going in to do those recovery pieces and actually very quickly arriving at the... We haven't got a congruent goal. People have lost their way somewhere along the line and, and don't actually know, um, are we bespoking it? Are we customising it? Um, and you've got people playing very different games rather than, the same, uh, rather than the same game. So for me, you've got to have that top, top vision. You need the right level of sponsorship and you need the right level of, of support in terms of resourcing um, because it's, again, it's a, it's a huge point for me whether you've got full-time resource on it or side of the desk part-time resource because th knowing those you know knowing those uh, characteristics will shape and define what you can do how you can do it um, and how quickly you're likely to get so there. is that defined by them in, or do you go in there and say this is what I need I, th I think absolutely I can impart a if you know Based on experience, mm. this is the typical size um, that I would set up in terms of, you, you know, commitment, number of people. Um, but ultimately, it, it's the decision of mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the finance department, the organisation to, uh, to drive that out. Because you'll always, you can offer advice and counsel, you'll always come up against the, the right to left planning. Mm -hmm. I want this done in three months. Okay. It's taken most organisations nine all right, maybe I'll negotiate four, you know, and you find yourself, you're, you're already on the back foot. Yeah. So not having that realism and that honest conversation up front then causes problems further down the line. It's my okay. honest appraisal. I, I, go go sorry. I was just going to add that it is, uh, I, I totally agree that the fir very first thing is to know why we are doing this and where we want to be. But what tends to be forgotten is where we are. Right. Yeah. So uh, that, 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 that is essential to define the road, how we get to where we are, mm -hmm. to where we want to be. And everything else comes from that, uh, because how long it will take, how much resource we need, how much it's going to cost, or what it is actually we are doing exactly, uh, it, it comes from that, those, those two, two end points. And then, then, then comes the fun of, of uh, planning the journey. That Suzanne said that one of the things that, that, that she found was exactly that. Someone would say, oh, they've implemented the system and, and, and you know, it wasn't, it couldn't get an accurate P&L. And um, she would then ask the question, well, could you get one before? And they think about it and they say, well, no. 
And it's, you know, it's not a magic panacea. You can only, you know, you have to go back to your foundations of what you're putting in the information you have. And that was a big thing for her. Yeah. What do you think, David? You, would you agree? Yeah, I, I, yeah, 100%. I was smiling when you were saying about we want it in four, four months. It's like, I'd run a mile. It's like, yeah. Yeah, this is what it's, it's going to take you. I, actually, I think there was one step before in terms of, I think, the question about yeah. foundations, yeah, definitely planning, where are we, 100%. I think for me, there's one step before that, certainly being on the inside of the finance team, which is that thing about mindset. Um, you, know, you, you know, we talk about change and it, you know, potentially removing people's jobs or synergies or efficiencies, but actually for me, to, for this to work, you need the mindset of the finance team to be in the right place to want to do this. Um, they're busy with BAU. Um, there's so much to do and it's like, you know, why, why should they break their backs doing doing more stuff that, that could actually make them redundant or yeah. I'm exaggerating. Absolutely, but it, very much a, so. Because you said that sponsorship that, that ties yeah. into that. And that is that is absolutely what I find as well because when it comes to transition, uh, we we get we come against that. We, you can you can really tell which are the leaders who who have, have put themselves behind it and, and provided that sponsorship and keep updating their teams and who are the ones who are not sold on themselves yeah. <laughs> and that their, their teams are not cooperating. So that is... That, that I is, want to cover that, that, that in actually more detail because I think that is really critical to success of the project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, another thing that Suzanne said, that she said, you know, you, you start off saying, why do you want to do it? And, and she said that what she finds in organisations that have gone wrong is that People want to do it because they've CEOs sat at a business lunch and the competitor's got it, or he's got it over there, and suddenly they don't want to be left behind, and they want, you know, they want the kind of latest technology, and they want this, that, and the other as well. And she said, you know, they think they're the same because they're in the same sector, but actually they're not the same. You know, what, you know, what processes have you got? Back to the processes. You know, what's the staff longevity of your staff? What's your culture of an organisation? Although on the surface you might think, oh, we're the same as that company over there. You're never the same, and therefore you can't necessarily expect the same outcomes. And that was, you know, for her, that was a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you're right. Just if an executive sponsors it, doesn't mean you've yeah. got the the mindset of the people below it. And I think that. So I think for, to answer the question for me about what do you need, well, uh, you know, I can go in a bit more detail on the mindset. But actually, you know, what's the purpose of finance? It's not just to get month end close or get the accounts done. For me, when I go into teams, I'm trying to inset a a mindset of, you know, why are we here? Why, why, why do we do what we want to do? And I, you know, have a workshop with them, trying to flush it out, but try to steer them as well as, but ultimately trying to get them to a place where actually finance is there to, to make the business a success. It's there to help the business make more money. Um, and as, as trained, skilled professionals, that's what we can help with. Secondary responsibility of finance is controls, governance, reporting risk procedures of course that that exists we have to do that but that's secondary to the primary objective mm -hmm. and if you can get that we're here to help make the business make a success that means change that means improving yeah. um, and that doesn't mean redundancy is necessary it means actually how do we make ourselves more efficient to free ourselves up to do more better work yeah. not not you know pushing pushing data around um, so I think that mindset is, is if you've got that, then there's a willingness to, an openness to, okay, actually, there, there is a better way. So you're talking about the mindset of your finance team the or finance the mindset team, yeah. of, the, of the organization generally? Of the finance, yeah, the finance team first, just because probably that's the thing I'm directly... Yeah, yeah. and I think influence. it's interesting that you ask that because uh, the, let's not forget the organization because I think that's another thing that we need to understand how the planned transformation, the changes affect the organization beyond finance because sometimes we just tend to focus on ourselves don't we True. so how, how it affects everyone and listen to them because they they have they have very good insights they have concerns which if they are if they go unanswered then again you come up against the resistance so who would you typically you say listen to them who would you typically go out to in the business to to to, to listen to hear from and find out what their problems are and how do you actually do it because they, they don't care do they you know they just want things to run they don't want to put the effort in, frankly, sometimes, I think. Well, if, if the sponsorship and the change management is there, then they do care, but because they, they do understand that their, their own ob objectives and uh, everything that they need to do or want to do depends on this. So they, they need to understand that. And how uh, ideally face-to-face, -face, it is literally, uh, well, we are now planning, it is literally called a roadshow. And going round to each country, to each factory, to, to speak to people there, to speak to everyone, 
Uh, it is not always possible in person, but we can do it, uh, do it online, of course. But that is, that, is, that is key. So you cannot really go around that. And adding to that, like, who, who are these other stakeholders? I think um, if you think about ERP, it's, it's like the core of the business. Like, it's the very, it's everything, it's holistic. So the sales and marketing teams are obsessed with forecasts and sales and pipelines and CRM, and that needs to be hooked in. The people team are all thinking about forecasting and 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 pay, um, what it calls what the, the, the headcount of the of the organisation. Um, so that has to be plugged in. Operations, you know, shipping things around the world um, and inventory. That so it all hangs together very very quickly. So I think you you get warm audiences when you say actually there's a better way of doing this, mm. um, and we can help you with with your thing because actually you know, at the moment it's it's painful. So I think focusing yeah. on the organisation pain. Very much so. So in my current project, we, we are moving supply chain finance, FP&A, into the shared service center as well. So which means visiting every factory and speaking to the factory manager, the factory engineer, everything, everyone who has a vested interest in this, uh, in this change. Okay. James, you talked about you know, that kind of stakeholder sponsorship and having kind of clarity of, of the objectives. How do you actually get that? Because it's a bit woolly, isn't it, sometimes? It is. It is, to be fair. And I think I try and distill it into very simple language. Is, is, this, a, is this an improve or, um, or is this a, you know, is it a fix and improve or, or is it a transform? Because if you can understand in, in, at that level, it's easy to sell to people in and outside of finance to me because you're either saying that we're going to make this better yeah. This is, you know, there's your sales headliner straight away, rather than getting bogged down straight into the, the detail of we're going to put in a new finance system and the sales director has gone, yeah, mm. okay, you, you know, we've <laughs> that doesn't do it for a lot of people. We'll know the value of, of bringing in, you know, a good tool set um, and how that can speed up our reporting. So, you know, to your point where month ends fade away and it's like, it's day ends, you know, and, and then their eyes, you know, oh, actually, I could get a lot more frequent, relevant information, up-to-date information. And, and it's being able to, I think face-to-face is, you know, is definitely, uh, you know, a, a key um, metric. But it doesn't have to be the, the only one. I think each organisation has d- different approaches um, how they handle their communications. I think it's key to understand um, what is your organisation's best, um, best form of communication, whether that is, you know, is it email? Is, it, is, it, is email the best thing for everyone? No. Do you have to use a v- variety? Quite what else often. would you use then? What else has it seemed in terms of getting the message out? Well, mentioned earlier, roadshows are, a, you know, a good town halls. Um, you, some people like that um, more grander approach to it. Sometimes someone just will quickly relate to, can we grab a, you know, a coffee and a 15 minute conversation so I can bring you up to speed on that journey, um, where we're going um, and where we're at at the moment. So I think understanding that is also a great building block for success. So that's so not a one size fits all? It's not a one size fits all because some organisations do newsletters updates or intranet um, pages. So there's, you know, often I find that the, the successful um, projects and programmes have used a combination because we know when we're in a room, some people like uh, pictures, yeah. some people like, you know, the numbers and some people like the words. So we've got to kind of uh, appreciate that. And I bet there are some organisations that think they have, everyone listens to the town halls or they love their intranets. And the reality is really different. In the, you know, I know I don't look at a newsletter when it comes into my inbox. <laughs> Profession. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's the reality is, isn't it? They think that all well, this is good and this works, and it's it's you know, it's trying to get them to understand perhaps where they are. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes uh, you know, one way that I've used to get around that uh, that mm. exact challenge is almost use the uh, use it as a teaser. So I will send out um, 
communications to either people di directly or filter it through um, the, the teams themselves, the various leads and say, oh, look out for um, the newsletter in, in the next week because you'll find out about this or what's happening next. So it's, uh, it's kind of my version of, I suppose, the EastEnders, dum, 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 <laughs> it's, it's coming, you know. Yeah. Okay. And it's feedback, really, I yeah. guess. It's yeah. a, you, all, all through the, the process, you listen, and because we are in finance and love measuring things, you, 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 you measure through the feedback whether, uh, whether it's successful, whether it's getting through, whether you are achieving your objective with that particular type of communication, or it's sometimes you're saying something and sometimes here's a completely different thing. So you are and just if you leave, you leave the gap, people fill it with misinformation. <laughs> very, yes, absolutely, very true. yeah. Yeah. Just, just one other thing I want to ask you about stakeholders. You said getting this key stakeholder sponsorship clear, and you talked about everybody having clear roles, but also understanding the expectations of each other. When everybody's got different jobs to do, and, and I'm talking outside the project team, I'm talking about your kind of senior stakeholders, that, that's quite hard, isn't it? And that accountability, or is it not? How do you do that? It is, and I think when you set up a, a project or programme, having what often gets called a, a steering group, that opportunity to bring people in, whether it's a, you know, the frequency could be fortnightly or, or monthly or even quarterly, depending on the length of the, um, the implementation. So you set that out at the start, so you set that, say that? Okay. Set that out um, at the start. So within, you know, here's the audience within that steering group. This is what I'm expecting. You know, the steering group is, is there to steer the, you know, to provide that stewardship and decision making. And I think once you're able to make it clear and create a forum and a platform for them to have a view and be aware, you know, how are we going to resolve the risks and issues? In an ideal world, people don't want to hear about risk and issues, but actually the more honest and transparent conversations you, you have in that steering group and say, well, yeah, we have got, we've got risks, we can't reconcile at the moment. Um, do we, A, add more time into the, the project, B, bring in relevant expertise, or is, is C, is there another option that we need to consider that we're not considering right now? Um, so having that steering group is, uh, you know, is key. And having people, most importantly, engaged in that steering group, because again, you'll you'll get stakeholders that go, "You don't need me there, do you?" You know, and, and it's like the, the answer I say, "Yeah, have you been invited?" <laughs> you know, there's your answer. I, I want you there because this isn't just a this is an organisation project that happens to be servicing uh, finance, but the point is, it's an organisational project or program. And that's how I try to take and, people on the journey. And but that's that is set out at the start because once Absolutely if you don't set that at the start, it's very hard to come back from that because you know people do go off and do their own things, or they lose interest in that part of the project, or they don't deliver on the bit. That it, 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 it's a kind of snowball, isn't it? It, it gives that a, accountability. Yeah. You know, to it keeps everyone honest, I suppose, because if you've not got, you know, I've seen people do it a number of times that that plan just gets updated and updated and you, you see it sliding and sliding but if you've not got somebody to hold you to account and say why is it you know we said three months it's now at, at six you, you know and I've heard no reasons as to why and there might be very good reasons but I've heard no reasons as to why it's shifting it, it does make a it does make a difference having something to anchor to I suppose in the form of a steering Said, uh, said the, the project manager, program manager, absolutely, you, you're right. I think you know, the, I, I would never dare to tackle a project like that without having a, a, a dedicated team, dedicated resource to the project and to do it properly because uh, I'm sure we're going to get onto the um, when things don't go to plan, but actually, you know, what do you need to, for success? Of course, you need buy-in mindset, but you need the right project team um, and all the good things that, that you, you just said there. Um, <coughs> And, and then, you know, then there's the stakeholders outside of why are we even doing this thing. I think you can use um, carrot or stick. You know, if you can't get the numbers out, I, you know, the, the company is just lost at sea, right? That, that become, that's an organization-wide issue. And if you're, depending on you know, the stage of the company, whether you're, if you're a public company, that's like, 
<laughs> game over. Imagine standing up in front of the market saying, we don't know what our P&L is, sorry. Like, that's not, never, that's like, that's, that's like dread, nightmares. Yeah. But, or it could be the next funding round, or it could be the investors or the board meeting. There's, there's pressures, and to get this stuff right, it becomes an organizational issue. So that's kind of more the, the stick, which is bad things happen if we don't get this right. But then there's the, definitely the carrot approach as well, which is, um, I think you mentioned finance as a profit center, mm. but actually, you know, this can add a low, load of value to the organization because we get faster, better, more efficient, mm -hmm. smarter. Yeah. And then actually the business turns faster, the business moves quicker because um, everything is working. Mm -hmm. um, and that has a very real value when it comes to execution and, and, and business value. We, we, we talked a bit about the if you don't have the right information going in, you can't get the right information out. So that planning process there. Yeah. Until you really get into a project anyway, you don't know what you don't have potentially. So how can you set timescales which you're then accountable for to your board or whoever it might be? What do you, what do, you do there? So, it's the, so there's a, a phrase called T-shirt sizing. So projects fall into that small, medium, large. And, and I think there's always a, a tendency to, whether you call it T-shirt sizing or something else, to make a call up front as to how long the project is going to be. And I've always said, you know, we will only be able to do a certain amount in the discovery phase. But it is critical that we do that. We don't skip it. We don't shorten it because you find the two areas, I won't go into it too much and come on to another bit, but the two areas where you go light in discovery or you go light in testing, they will become your heaviest pain points. So I say up front, we need to understand, and we've touched on it, but about what's the baseline? You know, if we've not got great quality of, of data at the moment, it's not in the right place. We're not going over to the panacea without a lot of um, data correction. Um, so we've got to build in that uh, that migration and allow sufficient uh, sufficient time to do it. Um, so that would be my you know you, you've got to uh, you've got to set your stall out as far as allowing a de decent discovery, mm -hmm. but you but also manage the expectation. It's discovery. It, it's not the answer. So it's it's giving you a formative view. But you ask, you know, sometimes you'll have a project and they say, right, we want, this is going to be delivered, go live on the 1st of April, possibly a bad day. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go live 1st of April, it's going to save us 7 million, whatever it might be. You know, they get very fixated on that. But are you saying that you, when you're setting your strategy, when you're setting goals, until you've done that discovery phrase, you can't realistically have an endpoint, or can you? I, I think it's one of the pitfalls that people fall into because there's always this pressure of we need to get this money spent by the year end or, you, you know, and there's, there's often a, a driver, but you spend more in the long term if you don't de get it right. And you see, you know, and I've seen technology organisations that have a huge failure rate. Um, so you've got to create that environment where bad news is, is acceptable because we're creating a, an honest and open conversation. And so uh, don't be afraid to change tact. Don't be afraid to say, yeah, based on the discovery, we did think it was six months. But the reality is we've now found the data is even worse. And so we need to at least do three months worth of, of work on that. Um, I think if you, again, it comes down to the sponsorship and, uh, and, um, and understanding. You know, sometimes you, you will meet those people that just say, I'm not budging. You yeah. just have to but find a way to get it done. And, and actually, James, just like, what about, like, you mentioned data, but I, I've also, uh, interestingly, thought it's like, you know, if you've got crap processes or non-existent processes and people think, oh, the ERP is going to solve that, but actually there's just, like, it doesn't, it's a tool but if the, the foundation should be good processes and data, you know, good discipline processes, do you, is that, do, you, do you see that as part of discovery as well as actually... If well, actually do you sort that out first before you even start? Yeah. Where do you, what do you do? Well, and, and I think that it has to be part of your... Yeah, it is almost a pre-discovery um, in the sense of baselining, um, using the discovery for actually getting beneath the surface, but understanding 
straight away, where is the organisation at? Where are we at as a, as a department? Have we got A, B, C? Uh, because if we haven't, you know, I, I did some early work in um, my career around supplier management and, and throughout managing programmes, I've often worked with uh, third parties. You can't outsource a problem and expect it to be fixed. You're just outsourcing a, a problem and you'll just end up with more problems because um, it's harder when you're once removed to then fix that problem uh, at speed without making contractual changes and you know commercial impacts. So it's very, I think it's very important to have that information up front as to a, a very clear view as do, do we have documentation? Do we have the processes clearly understood? And, and if you that, don't, get those sorted don't. first. We need to get those sorted. Yeah. Or we need to add that on as part of delivering the, the project we'll need to do that part as well. Mm -hmm. Again, something that um, is often underappreciated and undervalued, and then you get all the way through to the end and you go, well, it, it, was, it was always destined for an element of failure because mm -hmm. we, we didn't know what we, um, what we were doing to be, what we were kind of, where we were starting from. Therefore, we've just ended up going on a journey mm -hmm. to somewhere. David, these are kind of big projects we're talking about here with big <coughs> expense. I just wanted to touch on, you know, some of the businesses you work in that scale-up world. Mm. It, it, it's, it's not a big project we're going to fix, you know. Where do you even start? You know, what do you look at? Can you talk us a little bit about, you know, yeah. how you decide what you're going to automate, what you're going to, you know, process is, what, yeah, what I technology are you bringing in? I think it goes exactly what you said, which is where are, where, where are we right now? Um, we... we um, some of the organisations I've walked, worked, walked into, <coughs> uh, you know, actually it's been a, a build actually, that there's things that just don't exist there. You have to literally either build them from scratch or um, they're broken and you need to turn around and fix them. Um, and I, having done it a few times, I started to see a lot of commonalities. Um, I'm going to put up your yeah, I, finance this capability is my, framework. This is my bespoke, this is what's in my head. Um, <laughs> Um, it's called the Finance Capability Framework. I'm sure there are other frameworks available out there, but this is just what, what I created. I don't, don't think it's exhaustive, but people say, oh, finance, can you just, you know, as CFO, what are you walking into? And I was actually, hang on a minute, finance is actually quite broad. There's a lot of areas in finance, as you guys probably know. Um, and I said there's probably 14. I think there's one that I've missed there, which is business partnering as well, as I'm sure there's others. But there's like 14, 15 areas of finance, and each one is, has a slightly you know, has different controls, has different value add, different opportunities, and they can all be in different places depending on, on what you're walking into. Um, and so I, I now use this as my go-to <coughs> tool to go, where are we? And I sit down with a team and start at the top going, you know, management accounts, what's the capability, what's the speed, what's the quality of that? Is it accurate? Um, and this is, you know, at the group level, or maybe division A, division B. Um, I, I did this as a red, amber, green, high-level dashboard, but beneath, Within each box is a, you know, what's in my head of experience of you know, all the different things I would expect in a management accounts or a cost management or a procurement process. And that just helps me, red, amber, green, where are we? And you can just heat map towards. <coughs> and do you go with quick, do you start with quick wins, wait till you can show your adding value, or do you go with the ones that are the biggest value add? Um, so I think if that's where are we now, then there's the second question, which is where is the value here? Because if something's red, that could just be actually, that's like, um, a, a, you know, we, that's the basics. We need the, the health of the business to have good management accounts. If not, like, you know, there's, there's some issues there. So it can just become straight obvious of, let's go fix the fires, the immediate big fires. Maybe there's a small red fire that doesn't need fixing right now, that's later. But you just start to prioritize very quickly on either what's the biggest fire or What's the biggest value? Um, you know, once you've stabilised the fires, you can then focus on um, where's that? Where's the ROI here? Where's the value add? You know, so for example, in this one, treasury and banking, that might not be your biggest pain because actually there's some red things up here. But actually, if you get that right, there's a load of value to be added very quickly, and, and certainly I've seen that in my experience. So it, it's it's where are we now? Where's the value? Where's the fire? And just trying to chip. You can't solve everything in the first in the first three months. You you need teams and resources and time and patience to, to tackle these things. But this is a, something I, I find and, and, useful. And when you're working with some of the founders, perhaps in a, a scale-up organisation, the investors all know what good looks like and they know what it can think. But presumably they don't know what they can have in these areas. Are you, how much are you hand-holding and almost selling to them what could be 
Absolutely. Versus, uh, you know, just thinking, you know, that kind of old fashioned view of, you know, I'll get some management accounts and that'll be enough, you know. Yeah, because that, that, a lot of early stage businesses, that, that's, all, you know, that's all they've seen. They've got, um, you know, the accounts are sorted, you know, people are being paid, money's being collected, that's it. That, you know, actually, uh, even one step before, there's some organizations or people I've worked at, it's like they've never had CFOs before, they've never had a sophisticated finance team. So it's like, what is that? Why do we need that? Um, so that even that is a an education in a cell, and I think again this is quite useful to say. Well, these are the things that are burning. Let me take it box by box of why, how this impacts your business, mm. the the money that you're missing out on, the opportunity or the value that you're missing out on, but also how does this impact your your exit or your EV or your next fundraise or your your profits, um, and then then it becomes very very real. It's like actually you know when you start putting pounds and pence across these things. Um, it starts to add up real quickly, um, really quickly. When you start executing and, and solving some of these things, um, you can then start having some wins, right? Some quick wins of, of we've added this value, going back to the profit center. Finance doesn't just become, oh, we have to do these things every month. It becomes actually, we're putting points on the board um, and actually becomes a very high ROI uh, team in the organization that therefore, if you do need investment to do a big project, you know, you've, you've built that credibility to actually say there's more opportunity here. And I don't, um, I did red, amber, green here, but you know, there's a more sophisticated level zero to level five, you know, level five being best practice um, and level zero being non-existent. You don't have to be best practice at everything, across everything, right? You can pick your battles um, depending on, where, on how sophisticated the team is, where the value is and where the, where the pains are. Um, so yeah, I found that quite useful. Um, Looks good. Free for anyone to use it, um, or uh, feedback <laughs> actually probably more, more relevant, I'm sure I've missed a few things on that. Just something there that you talked about that I think is important, and perhaps we're moving on to the, a little bit on the, the, the kind of process, but you talked about big getting wins, and that's important in showing value potentially. How do you feed, you know, in order to be valued and to, to, to have finance viewed in a slightly different way, that information does need, go, need to go back to the business doesn't it, the key state. How do you communicate that effectively so people can say, oh my goodness, wow, this is what they're doing and how they're making a difference and how it's different? James, let's... Yeah, so I, I think for me, it, it's that um, traditional accountant versus more the business partnering role now. The, the more you're aware of the running of the business, I think the easier it becomes to reach that profit centre view of the world and say, well, actually, I've, I can help you get to that point, or we could, you know, we could actually, through this analysis, change our, change our margins up by, you know, two basis points and still not lose any, you know, lose any attrition. So I think it's that building those relationships and business But do you partners. shout about it? When you've Absolutely. done that and it's gone up, how do you shout about it? So that you, so you get the recognition, I suppose. Yeah, so uh, again, I, I'd make it clear in, in the re reporting, you know, but we'll have to do summary, uh, whether it's exact summary, monthly uh, reports. I'd, I'd kind of, you know, it's, it's not just about um, saying, oh, look, look, look at me, look, look what I did, but it's about look at, look at what we helped the sales team achieve this month and take, you know, rather than it just be, you know, go around the table and the sales director says, yeah, my team are fantastic. We've just, you know, nailed this month's revenue. Uh, you go, yeah, but with help from, from us, I think building those relationships outside of finance and across the uh, organisation gives you that platform to then, you know, because then... The and it gives you the platform to do more, doesn't it? And to yeah. implement, you know, teach to, when you come up with the next idea that you think is going to make a difference. A hundred percent, because I think you know when you've, you know when you've hit that, um, uh, that mark when you don't have to go to them and you've got somebody around the table saying, well, actually, because of the work that they did, mm. we've been able to do this. Uh, you know, that, that to me is you've, you've nailed it. Yeah. I think you, you said the key word there for partnering. So when finance is elevated from mm. serving, servicing to partnering, and that business partner role, that I've seen because I've, I've, I'm also, uh, the, the work I do often comes with target operating model uh, implementation. And that is what I see the surgeons of the business partnering. It becomes a, it, it's, its independent role. And it, it, that, that is the, the link. 
David, do you do anything shouting? Uh, from the rooftops. Um, <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> as loud and as broad as I possibly can, because there is a st there is a, a stereotype about finance being back office, cost center, overhead, and actually we have to change that stereotype. So every any and all opportunity where I can broadcast a win from the finance team, where we've put points on the board or fixed something or added value or made something better or faster, I'm broadcasting that to the whole organisation. Um, we, um, in some of the organisations I've worked in, um, we have recognition channels, whether it's wins channels or high five channels, but broadcasting that and, and recognising the individuals who have contributed, it doesn't have to just be finance, it could be collaboration outside of finance, but I do this, um, I, I try to ram it home, which is someone's done something really great, put it on a broadcast channel to the organisation, I try to quantify the value of it and actually put these little emoji uh, money bag things in there to say, and this is how much money, you know, cash coin that's been added to the organization from this. And sometimes it's like 10K, but sometimes it's a million. Wow. And you get like a million of, you know, of the, um, don't put I, a million I do. cash bags on, do you? <laughs> but, but actually they're, they're denominations of a thousand pounds each. So oh, actually wow. yeah, I did do a, I did do a, a, a thousand because wow. it was like- um, Very visual. Very, but exactly. It's like we are adding value, we're punching value, and therefore it, it changes the mindset of what we're doing is profitable and valuable to the business. And the other thing I then would tally up on, on the front page of the management accounts on the exec summary, there's a um, value that we've added this year, like a running cumulative total, which just, again, just rams Ooh, it home I like that. that yeah. we are not here uh, as a cost center. We're here to put points on the board. And therefore, when I come asking for resource or, you know, it's because we can do more and we want to do more um, and we will we'll, we'll, you know, win. So it's that changing that... Uh, yeah, so broadcasting and trumpeting at all opportunities. Absolutely. I, I and, and, and throwing a few vouchers around as well as a few, you know, some cash vouchers as well done and, and just little things like that just make people feel you good. You can be taxed on those, you know. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Are they expecting a thousand of them as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just coming back to when you, you know, you're doing a project, one thing I did want to ask all of you, and this is perhaps more big projects, but maybe not, is well, how do you balance the current people you've got in the organisation versus bringing in experts, what percentage is a perfect project team? Because you don't, James. Yeah, for, for me, the, it does depend. It's gonna sound a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, of a PC sort of response, but it, it does depend on the, uh, on, the, on the project itself. Where I've seen things not go right, we tried to do it with 100% internal resource on something that they've never had experience using before. So it takes longer, it costs more, um, you know, and you're learning from and you're making those mistakes, but you are still probably making a lot more mistakes than necessary. Um, so I think where if I look back across a broad range of programs, I would probably say, if you can get the balance in favor of your internal team, so maybe 60% internal, 40% external, you're building in some, uh, some opportunity to upskill that the internal resource rather than go 100% let's bring in an external team because they can do it quicker. They can do it quicker, then they walk off with the knowledge and you've got a team there going, I don't know what to do now. So I, I think there's definite value in having sort of, um, as I say, a weighted in favour of more internal teams because you're also sending a clear message to say this is your role going forward mm. i think when you bring in an external team there's a lot more ushered, ushered conversations going well you know this is to make sure that we, we're out at the end of this you know because they don't feel part of it and understandably so that's part of how you bring the people with you, you on the bring journey the people on the journey yeah, yeah. finance Pushka, what's, what, how do you bring people on the journey? Yeah, I, 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 will, I will disagree on a little bit, little, little oh, good, I love there, that we don't feel part of it. And that I, I take that personally because I'm an I'm, I'm, I'm outside consultant and uh, we have to feel part of it because otherwise, otherwise it, won't, it won't work. So the, the, the large, I, I, I work on large transformation programs. So we have a program team and there is a team for everything. There is a transition team, there is a change team, there is a comms team, there is, there is, there is everything. So there is a, a, a massive um, uh, third party uh, um, resource. Uh, and what tends to happen is we utilize the time of 
the current people in there and the knowledge uh, as opposed to you know, bringing them onto the project. It probably happens uh, a couple of people would would uh, come onto the project full time, but typ typically they don't. They have a day job, right? They, they have have still job. have to get out their management accounts or whatever it is. How do, and then you're asking, you're chucking more on top of them. How is that ever going to be successful? Yeah, exactly, but uh, then, but also they also, going back to your point, they have the knowledge. So I, as a, as a, as a consultant, I walk into a business, I have uh, some prior knowledge in general about the topic, but not specifically about the business. I have to learn that, and I can only learn that from them. And so you use a bit of flattery, do you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unashamedly, yes. We, yeah. <laughs> we need to, it, I think it is, it is very important to change in, in managing every, any change that anyone who's in, involved in that uh, is aware of the personal element of it, the human element. Yeah. It, we, we talk about systems, but in the, in the end it's all people. And, uh, and, and we need to deal with people day in, day out. And it is, whether, whether it's the experts who are quite, can be very senior or, or actually the, the, the actual person who's actually doing the job, um, we, we, we need to get, the, get their, their time and expertise and knowledge. But we also are also dealing with people whose job we are taking away. We are literally taking their job and giving it to someone else, and that 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 requires a, a very very uh, tactful approach. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we have the deadline and we have the goal to achieve. So that's a, that's a very careful balancing act. James, you, you you've got an amazing retention, haven't you, of people of not leaving the projects and not leaving the organisation till you want them to. How do you do that? How do you keep them engaged on board? Uh, um Transparency, um, really understanding. So, to your point, some people may be losing their their jobs. So, rather than leave a void for them to wonder where it is, you know, those upfront conversations to say, "Yep, yeah, this in, in twelve months, this is the the outcome." But also understanding who can you repurpose who can be you know upskilled or molded to actually you know still serve the the organization some people will just say look i don't want to i don't want to change see, i mean we as recruiters see a lot of those so people yeah. are not managing that process and they are jumping out before they get pushed out at the end of it but they're still valuable in that and i, I period you know for for me i'm a i'm a you know an amateur um, sportsman and uh, and one thing that you notice when you're on the field is it's, it's fast feedback. And we talk about doing that in, in organisations, but most that I've come across don't really do that fast feedback. And that, you know, it's not, it's better to deliver bad news than no news at all. It's, it's how you deliver it. So like you say, you, you, that personal element um, has, has certainly, you know, worked for me as far as I think people find it easier to respect you if you're if you have those honest and open conversations rather than leave them in this, in, you know, no no man's land, this grey area of I, I don't know what what happens to me because ultimately every individual there is going to have a con primary concern what what happens to me yeah. where am i in where do i feature in this master plan um so i think taking those people to one side and having those um conversations is is for me you know key yeah david any extra tricks for getting either the business engaged and on board or getting your finance team on board i think uh, you nailed it with the transparency and the quick feedback um even if you know, even if someone is a you know at risk of being made redundant, mm. you, they need to know that they need to understand the timelines of that, the, pot, the probabilities of that, you know, just so they can you know manage it and and they're your, therefore you can get the, the best out of them. Um, when you mentioned feedback, the, we um, we studied uh, the Netflix. There was I think there's a couple of Netflix books that have been published. And, um, the more recent one I can't remember the name. It was something about culture to. Uh, how to scale it, the, the nuts and bolts of how they did their scale up. And one of their, th their things that really resonated with us as an organization was the feedback, the fast feedback, which is say it, you know, and, and they gave a, a framework of how to deliver posit you know, actionable, constructive feedback immediately um, and how to receive it as well as, because actually it's, it's not always well received. Um, and that, um, 
that, that is great because then actually you don't have to sit on something, you don't have to bury it, it doesn't dwell, it's just out in the open, you can get managed. And I, 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 like, I like that and hopefully, yeah, sometimes you can go too, too far, right? Sometimes you can get it yeah. wrong, but actually if, the, if you're in a culture where it's expected to tell people what you're thinking um, immediately, then, uh, then at least you know where you stand. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, that then helps. Um, an expectation of failure sometimes. Yeah. Suzanne, again, coming back to our COVID person, um, she said that when she goes in, the first thing she does is identify the allies. And I was like, who, who are the allies? She said, the first thing I do is look for people that know what good looks like, who've come from an organisation where they've done it before, or they've, they've, they, you know, they're kind of switched on technology. So she's I identify those and get those guys on board. And then she said, I, I look for who are the influencers and who the ringleaders are, because those are the ones that are going to give you the noise. And I said, well, how do you get them on board? And she said, well, I'd go for coffee. I'd talk to them. People love talking about themselves. They love talking about their own pain points. They love problems. So she said, the, you know, a really key thing for her is literally just going out with those people who she knows are going to cause the problem and getting them on the inner circle. Quite useful. Keeping them yeah. Keeping yeah, you them see close. flattery. Keep, keep yeah, them always. Well, nice. And she's, a, she's, she's the repairer. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's all about flattery. <laughs> call it what you want, but it is, it is finding what works yeah. with each yeah. person. And, and, and you know, is. empathy is a big thing for you, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. yeah, very much so. You, can, you cannot add it's change. Then that's, I think, uh, the change management uh, uh, is, is, is so important. And change management is rooted in empathy. Yeah. OK, let's move on swiftly because I'm conscious of the time and I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. But what can go wrong and why? Who's going to kick off with there? What are the biggest? I'll tee you up, James. Um, <laughs> lack of resource, lack of project <laughs> management um, and, and skills, you know, having the right people doing the right thing. So how do you correct those things? It's all, you know. I think, yeah, um, measure twice, cut once. So I think I'm, I'm definitely resonating with the discovery phase, having a pro proper program, um, having proper resources. You can't get people to do more work if they're absolutely completely maxed out. It mm. just does, doesn't make sense. So you set yourself up for success. Um, and I think, yeah, planning and getting the, the right team on the pitch to do the job is, is critical. Gives you the best chance. Doesn't guarantee, but um, it's uh, going to improve your, your odds. Mm -hmm. And what we talked about, I think you, you said it, that setting up that governance, I think you used a different word for it, but to have that, that mechanism of dealing with the issue and accepting it upfront that, that you have done your homework, uh, but things will and will go wrong. And you have to expect the unexpected and it's going to go wrong. And, but if you Do have you a, manage that? Do you say that up front to your key stakeholders, to your yes. CEO, over it? maybe you say, this is going to go wrong. This, this is going to be bumpy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, there, there will be things that nothing is ever 100% right. And things will go wrong and we are prepared. We have that robust mechanism in place to deal with it. And the skills, yeah, the skills to adapt. Yeah. James? Yeah. I think the only thing I can add is bring your best people. Um, and it might sound blindingly obvious. Um, and probably it was a great moment for me when I went into an organisation as an external um, consultant and the CEO was very hands-on and we were talking about the team, you know, understanding the personalities and... Uh, each and every one of those was an expert, was highly regarded by the CEO, was best in class for, you know, so I, I, had, the, I had the FD who was, you know, a trailblazer in terms of understanding um, the complexities of the organisation. I had their best operational people. And I thought, well, right here, it's, it's difficult to see how this will fail because I've got the people to make it a success. I've got the people that know how to fix the problems that will- Did they put them on the project though? And they were all on the project. Okay, what about the times when they don't put those ones? Because they- And and that's where it, yeah. you know, in, in a, again, back to the kind of sporting analogy, if, you, if you're going out to win, you wouldn't put your worst team out on the field. But unfortunately, I've seen, you know, centers of excellence set up and, uh, the people are not necessarily excellent. Who gets put in those teams, do you think? Uh, sometimes, not all the time. Uh, the awkward people, the difficult people to, to manage. Um, and, and, and that's what you get sometimes in a, you go into a programme and they've gone, yeah, we've given you this, uh, this person. You're like, 
Yeah, Thanks. so it's off your desk and onto mine to manage. And again, that can be, it is a, it's a reality of life, but it's a, it's a distraction in, in terms of, if you really want to do this, then it shows absolute belief if you are standing and sending a clear message that you've got, they, everybody knew when this programme team was put together, everyone already knew that these were, you know, A star, pupils, if you like, of the organisation. So, you know, to a certain extent, that gave, a, you know, that did a lot of my communication part of my role for me because people were like, well, they obviously want this to work. They're obviously taking it seriously. Um, That's a really good point. And, and as I say, the, 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 the kind of the, the reverse of that is, yeah, if you don't put your, if you put your kind of, you, you know, I'm not saying that everyone has to be in the A team, but if you're starting to sort of go down to the uh, you know the Y and the Z team, it's gonna it's gonna be a, a nightmare, and it's not gonna work. How do you? Um, people don't want to give up their A team, do they? So how how are you how are you persuading those people or key stakeholders, whoever it is, to give up the A team to to, to put, be in the project? Well, I look at it I look at it in the in the round of when people are pushing for that answer when will you have this done it depends it depends what i've got is part of the calculation really for arriving at that uh, that date because if you give me the best people chances are we'll be able to uh, run fast and efficient as, as well and the efficiency is key if you if you're not going to put the best people in we're going to need to kind of work things through, they're gonna, it's going to take longer, it will probably uh, deliver at a later date. So I think there's definitely... And cost more. And cost more. You know, I think there's a, a balance there because usually if they give you the, the best people, it, you know, you're dealing with motivated individuals as well as SMEs, you know, and they bring that knowledge. Okay. Perushka. Do you hit your de- time scales? That's a big thing, isn't it? They want it delivered on this date. How often do you deliver on the date? And how do you manage, how do you manage a process that slips? Uh, so when, when we, like, let's just take the example that we are setting up a shared service centre, for example, and it's, uh, it will be 100 people, 100 odd people, uh, several countries, many processes, and they all need to go live at the same time. So that is one go live date. The go live will happen most of the time on that date. It will happen because we are ready, 80% ready. And uh, as we go along, there is we have the we have the the governance that we assess every any point of time uh, where we are with the project and uh, and how we are progressing. And there comes a go no go decision uh, before go live, uh, and that's that's when we discuss are we ready. And then usually the answer would be very typically that that. By and large, we are, and there are exceptions. And then we have a plan of how to deal with those exceptions, how much time we need to get them there. So that's, that's, how, that's how it usually happens. Again, Suzanne said that part of the problem is that the date of go live is almost arbitrary, you know, and they've decided that's going to be the date, and therefore it is. And she, she will say, yes, you can, go, you can go live still on that date, but you're going to have to put extra resource in and extra time, or you don't go live and you can have 80% of the functionality, which is what you said there, but actually it probably cost you more in remediation of trying to fix it after the date. So this kind of, it's almost getting away from a date that was set arbitrarily as the go live, but towards a realistic picture of where you are. Yeah, it reminds me of the, 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 the project pyramid of cost, time and scope, right? Um, you can't, it's almost like the physics of this project, you can't change those physics, right? You can pick one, which one do you want, but you can't have all the cake and all the, it doesn't exist, you can't, it's impossible. So, so where's the, where's the trade-off? What are you prioritizing? Risk, cost, time. Exactly, and then then there are there are there are times when when you're forced almost because, um, so retention retention works not always works. So you find yourself by the time you go live, half of the people who were providing the knowledge are not there anymore. Oh. So we have we have the the people who were taking on that knowledge who will have to carry on with if we find find ways to support them. Uh, within the organisation, or however we can, uh, but there is there is no other option, and that is that is the thing about these programmes that once you start, you have to finish. Yeah, there is no way back. 
David, finally, any, any particular advice to avoid pitfalls? Mm, pitfalls to avoid? Um, I think, yeah, um, nothing, that, nothing we haven't talked about. Yeah, I think resource, getting the right skills um, and resources available. Um, and you know, don't wing it. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't hire professionals like, like these guys. Um, Hire them through us I, and then back, okay. and back feel through us. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to open the, um, any questions for the audience to any of our, our panel. Question about culture and about mindset, my two favourites. And then to the talent edge people. How are you looking for those people through the recruitment to come on board in the first place? Because could we look at restructuring the way we hire people around mindset to drive that through the culture? Great question. Yeah, well, if I may, uh, I, because I'm, I'm doing most of the hiring into the, into the shared service center, into the FPNA team, not all by myself, but most of, the, most of the people we hired so far went through me at some point. And uh, I look for those traits uh, because I know the environment they are coming into and we want to set them up for success. And we know that this environment is changing, the role is evolving, uh, it is dynamic, so we need people who not only going to be able to deal with that, but thrive on that. And uh, I, I specifically design questions uh, as we go along to tease that out. And there were times when I just felt that, that the person would not be happy in that environment and not only once it happens and uh, that then it's just not a, not a right fit absolutely i mean i think certainly what we see is is that you know it's not about skills it's not like hiring an it person they can tick boxes do skills finance now and, and the people that get hired and the people that are desired it is all about the the softer skills around your communications around adaptability you know that, that kind of mindset for change because every finance is going to be going through change and you know using technology and and you want people that don't just think this, we're in a box and this is how i've always done it so i think more than ever this business partnering and the ability to be a business partner is what what our clients seem to look for rather than just they can do some management accounts and tick some boxes you know it's a definite shift yeah i've always been fortunate enough to where the organizations i've worked in have been very strong uh, over-indexed on culture and values and actually you don't get in the door unless you, you know, in our, go through our values uh, values assessment and values induction and, and, and you know, sheep dipping um, because actually you know, the organisations I've worked in need that level of, of change and, and, and uh, you know, collaboration and all, all good things. Um, so I've been fortunate enough to actually it's inherit in the company mm. um, in my situation. But you can't do it without people for sure. Mm, the right and, people. I, and I was going to say that I think, for me, the, the culture, a good measure of the culture is, are people afraid or fearful of failing? Because, as I say, the, the companies that, you know, people could probably name in this uh, room, Google the Googles, you, wasn't it? Yeah. The, you know, there, there's a high percentage of their projects that, that fail. But you know, human nature, we don't talk about the, uh, the, the failures. We, you know, we look at from the outside and the inside of the, that organisation, they'll talk about the successes. They'll learn from the failures, but they'll talk about the successes. And I think if you've got a culture where people are fearful of failing, they're going to try to hide things. So you won't necessarily understand the risks that are coming down the, the lines because they'll be like, I, I don't want to mention that. That's, you know, it's back to that bad news. Uh, I don't want to be a part of it. So by encouraging almost, I'd rather someone say, yeah, I've failed. I, I failed fast. I got up and I, and I, did, I did this. And well, that's all right. We're, you know, we're human at the end of the day. We will fail when we accept that we'll fail and we learn from it. That's the positive that, you know, that's going to take you forward and, and kind of hopefully propel you to success. Okay. Any other questions? I've got one quick question. With tools, we talked, we talked about ERP, everybody knows the ERP system. Are there any quick tools that you have, David, I suppose, really? Yeah. As in digital innovations that you think, here's a quick win, this is good, this is a good tool. Any, any, any? Yeah, there's, um, I think we're fortunate enough that there's loads of 
tech solutions off the shelf on the market and actually what you mentioned about fail um, failure, connecting that as well. Um, so, well, yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 I what get... What good tools have you got for no, that? No, I don't know. I, I was saying I get, there's loads. I get hit on from, from uh, all, every day with, with different uh, solutions. Um, but whether it's credit card solutions, I mean, actually some things that we've loved as a team that have solved problems and automated things. Um, so Plio as a credit card solution, that's really modern and, and works really well. Um, you know, leaving the, the old credit card tech behind and it's just like modern solutions that work and have user, great user-friendly experiences for the, the business part, um, people using them. Um, Pen, Pento, I hate to call it Pento, but um, that, was a, we, that was a failed implementation that didn't quite work. We couldn't, um, you know, and actually we, we put that on our wins channel. We had a, a wins and fails channel. Um, so actually celebrating the fails as well as, and we put, um, my head of finance put that up there as we didn't, couldn't get this to work and we, 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 set, you know, we binned it off. Um, and here's what we learned. Um, so, so sorry, sorry, I hope there are no uh, Pento people in the room, uh, but those are just a couple of, couple of minds. That wasn't the right fit for us at the time, I think right. it's probably best, but great solution maybe for others. Don't broadcast that, let's cut that out. Anybody else for a question? That would... uh, can I just ask about, I, I think for me, um, Hopefully you can hear me. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, one of the areas um, that I've found difficult to recruit people is in the area sort of that crosses finance to systems. And, you know, an example I'll give is like Salesforce, which I think is a great system. But getting people to set up their own reports and things like that needs quite a bit of training, things like that. So for me, there's, a, there's almost a new area, or I don't know, I'll get your views on it, of, you know, getting that sort of finance IT technical person um, and, and you need them in your team as well as all the people with the soft skills and all, all the other bits and pieces, but interested yeah. in your thoughts on that. 100%, I think that was one of my boxes, which is finance systems. Um, is it someone's spare, doing it in their spare time, winging it, or actually is, do we have a, a finance systems manager or finance systems team who are thinking about what's the right architecture, what are the processes that exist, are they documented, can we automate them? Obviously, not just administering the system as well as, but how do we make our stack better and better, and what can we plug in? Um, and that requires, you know, I think the the the, the systems manager I had uh, last year, um, he's part business process analyst, so he understands processes, he understands finance, he understands data, and he's also a project manager. So ticking four boxes, so he could uh, like great hire. Um, so that yeah, that's that's almost like the glue that combines the accountants and the. the outside of finance together. So yeah, big, big thumbs up for finance systems higher. Yeah, absolutely. Put that on the wish what, list. What I tend to find, I, don't, uh, I might have been uh, lucky or maybe it's the generation that I'm hiring from, but they, 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 if they worked in finance, they just inherently know because they have been I brought up. I think you're up. lucky there. <laughs> I might be. I might be. And, and then, then when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm at the interview and they say, and they say that, oh, I, I love like, creating, creating reports in the system and understanding how it works and, and improving things. And I'm like, OK, good. <laughs> you're welcome. So uh, we, I, I've had so many of those. And I thought that it might be normal <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that those, those who work in finance I get a lot of the Excel stuff that, oh, I, oh, I love doing things in Excel. And I say, yeah, that's good. <laughs> but but uh, it is they more often than not, they will, they will have used some sort of ERP system or some sort of accounting system. And um, I don't know, it, it may, be, may be luck, but I find that, that uh, the mindset, especially of that younger generation that I'm talking about, is very much system focused. And um, they, they, just, they just seem to know. I find it's, it's interesting for me that I'll, I'll hear the term shadow IT or shadow finance department and for me that is them not understanding the, exactly the point that you're making that actually you wouldn't bring in a, specifically an, an IT technical person and if you say finance technical it covers a, a raft of, of uh, skills whether that is you know un understanding uh, uh, international accounting standards and, and so forth so there is this uh, you know and, and and this is where i think possibly the new age accountants coming through there is this um this new skill set that needs to be developed that does bridge um the wider organization with some very um data technical level um sort of coding 
to, ge to generate the most beneficial um, outputs from the likes of Salesforce. And I'd just like to so Suzanne said to me actually, she was talking about it's actually about not your finance in that area, it's how you, your users, so the people using the Salesforce at the other end, causes a big mistake because you know, they're not using it and you need to get to the root cause of why. So, you know, is it that they don't know about it and that's not, is it that they don't see a need for it, they don't understand it, or is it the system that is wrong? And she said, actually, you can make all sorts of assumptions, oh, they're just not using it and they're difficult, but people inherently don't go out of their way to be difficult. So you need to, you need to go back to the business side and really understand, you know, how they're interfacing with the technology as well. Sorry, one... Um, similar theme for me, um, what's the panel's view on data scientists sitting within finance or you having that skill, uh, data so valuable, digital marketing, data within ERP systems for me and that feels like the future, just want the panel's view on that. Yes please, yeah, I'd put it on the, yeah, it's on the wish list, uh, I wouldn't say it's the first hire we need but actually recognising that as you go up that capability level, getting up to best practices. Data science, um, if I think about a company I was in a couple of years ago, we had a, I had a BI, I was responsible for BI, and we started to think about how do we bring in um, data science because there was a, there's a level that we're not getting to, and it's a higher level that uh, we couldn't get to ourselves. Um, um, but yeah, definitely on the wish list, and I think we're gonna see more and more. Very competitive though, you try hiring a data scientist, um, it's very difficult. Um, the, yeah, very very short supply and, and lots of demand. But it's a new it's a new skill. Yeah. Yes, yeah. please. Though. La larger companies tend to have a whole team of them, so we have master data teams who are dealing with those. Yeah, more of that though. I think yeah, we see more of it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say I've seen you know the the same the, the growing um, the growing trend in organisations to have you know the chief data officer who as part of their remit will have the data scientists and the data engineers. So you've got the guys that are building maybe the, the, the complex reports and then the guys that are analyzing those, um, those reports and outputs. So I think there's a, you know, that's sort of larger organizations. I also see them falling pro probably more in terms of technology teams because there's that natural, well, if they've got, they've got an ability to think in a certain way, um, they'll probably be able to then get their head around coding, uh, coding this. So, but I, I think the missing link is those, those skill sets that kind of integrate with fi finance specific knowledge. So they know what they're looking at. They know maybe how they can go about building the, the, best, um, the best report to get the most out of it, rather than somebody just, it's, if you, if you get somebody that's purely IT transitioning into that, you've got to be very directive and prescriptive. And actually, you want somebody that has got the flexibility and agility of mind to go, actually, what about this? Have you thought about that? Because that's where you're getting your true data science sweet spot. Yeah, I think the, adding on to that, the cherry would be if they're very commercial. A, com you know, a commercial data scientist is like, I think, you know, to go value hunting in the, in the data or in the customer or in the market, in the market base. Um, yeah, that's yeah, very valuable. Um, running experiments, making things better, better conversions. Um, yeah, add a lot of value there. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, lay at the front, sorry. Thank you, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, we're in the middle of a, a big systems transformation change, which includes the implementation of a, an ERP, but also um, an end-to-end -end procurement system. Um, and the finance system manager that you described is, you know, I, I live in fear of him leaving. He's absolutely critical. Um, I, I was wondering, um, we already have, you know, quite a bo bottleneck in procurement when we're taking um, suppliers through our due diligence and, and legal compliance. And I'm just wondering when we move to pre-commitment <coughs> approval and that volume increases exponentially, whether you have whether you've seen that done before, whether you've got any thoughts on tools and processes or resources that are going to help us prepare for that? Anyone? I, I, I think um, outside of, we used a, a tool called Approval Max once, 
which is uh, yeah, a modern light bolt onto a, a finance system that can do, you know, get the invoice of the supplier onboarded again in a modern way with apps and good user flows. Um, I haven't done it in, ER, in ERP, so I'd have to hand over to these guys on that, but uh, uh, there are some solutions out there. Maybe they can be plugged into ERP, but yeah. Um, I, I, I come with my outsourcing hat on, <laughs> so um, if, if it becomes that and, and it, is, it is becomes so, so much of a bottleneck, that's always always something to, to consider to outsource at least you know, some of it, the, the, the vetting process, the, the background checks, the, uh, the uh, you know, checking against the sanctions list, that sort of thing. Yeah, but there are certainly um, integrators out there that can automate um, the process and make that sort of uh, that decision making uh, as I say uh, digital rather than um, rather than analog I see the problem that when I've ran into uh, that, that kind of procurement due diligence is making sure that you've got very clear um, parameters around the if they've only been uh, trading for less than two years is it an out and out no even if they're the ones that have got this kind of latest and greatest innovation so there's a certain amount of what's the risk appetite of the organization because that will dictate to a certain extent how much you can automate um, because a lot of businesses that have been successful have, have taken risks on startups that ordinarily i know plenty of organizations they, they would have failed at the first hurdle because they've not got a full set of or two three years set of accounts or you know they've maybe missed a submission and, and they've got you know one of their company directors has now got a mark against their their name so there's a there's a, a human element I suppose to, to to carrying out that due diligence but if you can say actually 80% or more of our suppliers can follow this route then there is plenty of scope for a um, an integrated tool to come in and do that decision making. Yeah, segmenting who needs to go through the full process versus the quick process. There's, there's this, uh, I think I came across a solution called OnFido that did um, background, uh, you know, again, I think it's on companies, but and uh, yeah, had anti-money laundering solutions and uh, credit checks all built in. So uh, you know, there's things out there, but you don't need that for every, every supplier. I think it depends on, on the segments of, is this a, is this a core supplier? That the business you know, relies on, or actually, is this just a service provider that, yeah, you know, if it goes past, who cares? Brilliant, lovely. I think that's probably all we've got time for. So, thank you very much to our knowledgeable panel and the insight, and also thank you to everyone for for joining us today. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.